So, uh, hello, everybody, all our listeners, to the third episode of Podcast Old in the Sky. And uh, this month, we're talking about stupid, sexy vampires in the form of Diabolic Lovers and Twilight, two heavyweights of the bizarre gothic romantic trilogies here. So, uh, if anyone would like to get underway with the impressions, immediate reactions to these fine pieces of art, uh, yeah, go nuts. Okay, well, um, first off, um, unfortunately, one of our own, um, Dylan, uh, is unable to make it tonight. He might be able to pop in later, but um, anyways, we had so much to say about these vampires that we couldn't keep it to ourselves. As far as that goes, like, Diabolic Lovers versus Twilight. Like, what the hell? Um, <laughs> that's, that's, that's my basic impression. I was watching Diabolic Lovers and I kept asking myself, what the hell am I watching? Like, would you, would you agree with me? So Diabolic Lovers, it's kind of like Bram Stoker's Dracula. If Dracula wanted to have sex with Keanu Reeves, like, um, uh, it's this, uh, teenage girl. She goes to a mysterious mansion and she is treated as the property of these group of teenage male vampires and it's incredibly i'm not gonna say sexy because it's not but um i don't know very um 30 shades of gray maybe well what what it um makes me think of is um you know you mentioned dracula but i think more of other examples of gothic romantic drama because the iconic uh protagonist in gothic literature like 19th century stuff, like Uncle Silas, the castle, uh, sorry, the mysteries of Udolpho, that kind of thing. It's a young woman who's come into a castle or a mansion owned by a man who now has power over her. This man is sometimes a foster parent, uh, a new husband, or someone else with that kind of relationship. So it's kind of frightening being in this new place, and this new place is typically a very mysterious place with old secrets. Like one of the great cliches of this stuff is the room that you are not supposed to enter. And our heroine in Diabolic Lovers enters such a room in the very first episode. Where Diabolic Lovers differs from Gothic Convention is that you usually have one mysterious loner who may or may not have a kind of Heathcliffian uh, sexual interest. But uh, Diabolic Lovers being a harem anime gives us like a half dozen um, people that she's now the property of essentially. And they're all terrible. (laughs) It's like the typical reverse harem uh, show uh, with your typical characters, you know, the sewing guy, the, the bad boy, the kind of foppish one, et cetera, et cetera. The kitty, the lowly, you know, uh, and then flipped on its head, wherein they are all assholes. They're just all horrible, horrible creatures. Right. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think, cause I think it's based originally on an Otome game, which, yeah, pretty much it's a, it's a reverse term, sort of dynamic, uh, basically, visual novels, romantic visual novels for women. You get all your routes, uh, so you can go with your favorite uh, asshole. So, and those have been getting a lot more popular, I'd say, over the last, I don't know, decade or so. And so it is, it's capitalizing on, on that. And, of course, it's gotten the sequel recently. I guess, um, I guess the one guy, actually, the pink hair, uh, uh, male Sundere, he, he was okay. He just broke shit. No. He was, he was okay, comparatively, comparatively speaking. Th- that's what they call bar. the Overton window, you know? If your standards of guys are the guys in Diabolic Lovers, that's the only standard of good behavior you have. Yeah. Maybe. But I mean, come on. Well, I mean, like, his whole thing was that he was trying to resist and. And and he couldn't. He he ended up I mean, giving in. And, you know, like I mean, it's it that to me was it just felt very much kind of like this idea of well, just male sexuality as if a man is a beast that is holding back everything. You know, he was the one who was trying to hold back, right. and and in the end, he still 
he still gets her in the garden, you know? <laughs> yeah, well, you know, when it's when it's him or the fucking little kid with his ashes bear and mannequin women, <laughs> like, mannequin women. you know, he's the worst, by far. There's, uh, yeah, well, to, to clarify, there's, insane. you have the little, like, Shota character, mm. he's like the ten-year-old, and he's... Uh, and... And out of all the abusive too. douchebags, he's the worst because he carries around a bear with his mother's ashes in it, and then has a a basement full of like dead vampirized mannequin women. That he's pretty proud of. Yeah, so I'm not really sure what the target audience on. I can understand most of the rest of them on an objective level. <laughs> I'm not really sure. That seems a little niche, even for anime well, harem dynamics. Mean- which are I mean, by it's definition clearly it's clearly aiming for someone i mean i'm assuming you know your average 14 year old girl uh who wants someone to own her that's like kind of thing you know i mean that's why Twilight is so popular you know the idea that you are that somebody attaches to you viscerally and all of the boys attach to the girl now, uh in the show um, and of course they, I mean, it was so blatant, like that last episode where they literally have talk to the screen, the boys talk to the screen and tell, tell, essentially lay out their entire chair trait as if they, you know, were waiting for little girls to watch on TV at home and like film that little bit so that they could just like watch it over and over. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, you think about what's it called, uh, like, Wanamode. There's, like, two episodes that are great in that show where the character, uh, the main character, who's this high school girl who's, like, a complete loner and outcast and all these things, and she takes, like, she records her favorite lines from games like this that are all just telling her that she's, like, a dog or whatever, and, and she just <laughs> listens to them over and over and over, and then, you know, like, makes her own recordings and puts them in so it sounds like they're talking to each other. So, yeah, that's... Okay. But, uh... <laughs> like, that dynamic, though, I at least get. But the teddy bear kid, I just don't... Like, who chooses him as their favorite? <laughs> I want to know. Well, uh, the, the teddy bear kid is your standard, I would say, reverse lowly, right? So but he's so much uh, creepier. Uh, <laughs> he's so much oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but he his whole deal is... He's. I think that the appeal is the idea that he is the cruelest, but it comes from kind of a, mo- a place of innocence, if you will. Uh, he's cruel because he does. He literally doesn't know better. In fact, when he gets her on the ground, like uh, during the many times that he gets her on the ground, just like every other one of them, uh, but specifically in front of his mother's grave. He says something equivalent of like, oh, yeah, girls like to make out or something before sex and so on, right? I'll make sure to do that first, you know? Right, and right. so, like, so his whole appeal is is uh, he, he doesn't know. And I think there's this, uh, it's just like with all of these assholes, part of the appeal is that um, an asshole uh, wants you and will be slightly better to you, right? And I think with the uh, the innocent young man who's fucked up in the head, like it's like you, you get to teach him to be less fucked up or something. I mean, it's 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 a messed up, <laughs> yeah, you know, kind of fetishy fetishizing of of this dynamic. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's interesting the way. It's progressed, I guess, because, I mean, if you look at, I mean, the, even if you go outside, like, Japanese stuff, uh, I mean, obviously, Twilight, which we'll talk about, um, but basically anything from any culture, like, you're gonna get the kind of, like, brooding bad boy who you have to fix and change and all these things, like, that's pretty much standard in almost every culture, in terms, at least modern pop culture, as, like, this character archetype that, for various reasons, is is deemed desirable. But with all these, like, Otome-based shows, like, it's almost as, like, that's become passe at this point. And so they just have to keep making them bigger and bigger and bigger assholes. 
<laughs> and so this is where we kind of, because, you know, like the, uh, the, the, there's this brooding guy who, who turns out to maybe have a little bit of affection buried inside him. It's not enough anymore. They just have to be just pure control and hatred and lust. It's like all the, just boiled down to its most basic elements. Yeah, the the way that they that actually is a good assessment because the way that all of the young men treat the girl is with like total disdain. Uh, even if they're sort of lusting at after her and her blood, it's just this really disgusting, you know, uh, uh, sometimes apathy, sometimes straight out hatred of her presence in the house and her whole and i guess part of it is because of her her storyline is that she is about to awaken and uh turn into a vampire bride only they never survive they like the turn always kills them so i guess they've gone through a number of these young women who show up on their doorstep for literally completely unexplained reasons (laughs) um because we never know why she's there. Uh, there's like a hint that maybe there was a reason, but what? It turns out that that was a lie. I, could somebody explain that pot, plot point? Because I literally was like, I don't, I, I fucking have no idea what was going on there. I honestly wonder uh, if any of that is from the game, because um, the protagonists of these kind of games are usually um, self-insert characters. They often don't have a name. So you can just give them your own name and they have as very few details as possible about their background. So usually what happens with these shows is they usually have to give the characters a name and then decide whether or not they want to give them a personality. So it could be that if you play the game, you'd know even less about her. I mean, I don't know. I've not played the game. so. Well, uh, just going into the whole setting thing, the the house, the mansion, it, the whole th- show it almost takes place um, almost entirely inside that mansion it's um the setting of the atmosphere it's very small it's it's claustrophobic and it Mm. feels kind of incestuous like um Mm. it actually it feels like a play it's a very small cast and it takes place in one in one place and the world is almost empty of anyone else right and they even do go to school but uh, it's like after hours no one's there and stuff yeah yeah um, I, I, I just like want to say it's like Rebecca life. because if I say it's like Rebecca, <sighs> I think this is the third time I've referenced a Hitchcock film in one of these. I was gonna say actually, it's um, it felt to me similar to The House of Yes. Um, mm-hmm. uh, I'm not saying that it's in any way comparable in quality, but oh, yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> the way it, the way it's so small, the the way. It feels like nothing else exists except these people in this house. It's mm. it feels very similar. It's yeah, kind uh, of a, I, a, a general I, harem issue, though. I mean, as a cliche, parents are invisible in harems. Usually, like for example, in harems of male characters, they have a home. Their parents are out of the country or something, and they suddenly start living with a bunch of women for often flimsily explained reasons. There's a tendency to have the char- uh, audience insert character, then their potential romantic options, and they all live in one location, and they don't seem to know anyone else, especially anyone of the same gender as the protagonist, because that could imply another possible interest. Like there are exceptions, well, actually, obviously, but I feel like that it, it leans in that direction as a genre. Oh, well, that but, that I'm I'm thinking like maybe when I uh, I'm thinking fruits basket, you know, and hmm. um, yeah, and. They do, they literally set it up so that, um, I mean, first they find her, like, living in the fucking woods, and then uh, they take her in because her family is terrible, uh, but, like, the adults in that are terrible, or they're non-existent, and they do kind of go to school, but it's it's not as much of an afterthought as this show, wherein I really feel like the only reason they went to school was to get guys into uniforms. <laughs> and yeah, that's a lot of this actually probably does have to do with you know they want they're wanting to like tell all these very strange stories uh whether it's you know about you know sci-fi adventures or vampire houses or whatever but like mm-hmm. in terms of kind of the market aspect of this it's like you pretty much always have to keep the protagonists young and a everyone loves the school uniforms so it's like well 
you, you just create this school environment and you call it a school and everybody's school aged and dressed like they're going to school, but nothing else about the story is like that. So it's like, you're telling like adult, you know, big, big uh, quotation marks here, adult stories, but you're sort of compelled probably partially by market factors to like keep it in that school environment slash age. Well, I'm looking at the poster right now, their their main show poster, and they are all in uniforms. It's just like, you know, their character's take on what the uniform should look like. Right, uh, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, that totally makes sense, just uh, <laughs> this market for uh, teenage, heartthrob, young men, bad boy character. <laughs> <It's>, uh... <laughs> The actual like as a viewing experience, how did how did we all respond to the show? Because for me, the first I'd say two to three episodes, the comedy value was just like enormous. Like it was just through the roof. Like I could not stop laughing. Especially uh, there's there's two scenes in particular. One, which is pretty well known, where he like picks up the the one of the vampires picks up the girl while she's sleeping. And throws her in the swimming pool. <laughs> and he's like, tell me I'm the best. <laughs> and she's like, I can't swim. <laughs> and so, yeah, so there's that scene. But, of course, then he feels slightly bad that she's about to die, so he saves her. Um, and then there's the scene, I think, in the next episode where, like, the alta, the intellectual vampire um, is like, oh, I'll, I'll make some tea. And then it cuts, and he's sitting in his chair with just one cup of tea, and she's standing, and he's like, Oh, did did you think I was gonna make tea for you? <laughs> like the level of just dickishness was so high that I couldn't I couldn't stop laughing. Like it was it was just comical. I literally called her bitch. Right, <laughs> little yeah, bitch. bitch oh, oh god, bitch Chan. It's all going back to me now. <laughs> yeah. Bitch to be honest, Chan, I feel like I've repressed a lot of this show since I watched it a couple months ago because I, I okay. So that, that's just flooding back to me how often he said that. But, but then, like, after, like, the fourth episode, like, I wanted to kill myself. Because, yeah. because like, once you've seen, like, one vaguely sexual, but not that sexual, you know, bite scene, you've seen them all. And it's not like the plot anywhere really goes anywhere. So it just turns into, like, you know, it's like six more episodes of the exact same thing. And the, the comedy value just diminishing returns. So it's like... To me, like, every time she was on the ground of getting molested by these guys i mean it was just total in your face uh rape scenes basically molestation scenes to me i mean seriously this girl doesn't want any of this and she's it's not until the very end where she does kind of a 180 and goes like oh no i don't want the boys to be sad and it's like why why do you care <laughs> stuck over <laughs> you are literally it's... been zitten by all every single time you're saying no please don't stop you know and not not really in uh uh oh no not again kind of fashion you know what i mean it's like a straight up like oh god it's happening again kind of it's, situation uh, stuck on <laughs> the show That's exactly so at the end she literally what kills herself so that the boys will stop i <laughs> won't die that yeah, was just it's, a, to me. it's a slightly interesting well, conception of um, love. Okay, so I have to confess, <laughs> um, when I was watching the show, I kept pretending I was watching something else, that um, that it was actually an elaborate role-play scenario, like an s and play between the girl and the guys. And I was wondering why this improved the show, and I realized, because with this alternate story, the girl actually has agency, that she's she is actively taking part whereas in the actual show she's just there and stuff happens to her she's like they're the doll for the guys or something right but is, what's is weird it, is that's the is, appeal too isn't that, that the audience. kind of what it is though i mean like in a situation where you're role-playing a fantasy where this kind of thing is happening to you the character you're pretending to be is unwilling Right. Yes. And yes. in this case, you know, the audience have all come for this. The people who watch the show, the people who buy the Blu-rays, who play the Otome games, they want this. They want to participate in this fantasy. They want to see themselves in this girl. 
and they are they find one or more of the vampires appealing in how they treat her as a fantasy, not not as a real thing. So isn't it isn't it in some sense equivalent as a form of entertainment? Yeah, or, or is that not true? I don't know. I think that's where the interesting yeah. question lines. Yeah, the thing with Twilight, and I was about halfway through, through this show, and I was like, this is a perfect compare contrast, personally, because uh, frankly, both Bella and Yui are perfect insert characters. They are empty shells, you know. Uh, both are very they have very little agency they have uh very sketchy character traits um and uh if you i don't know if you read the books at all or just saw the movie uh but when you're reading the book um it really is like you're you're uh you're putting yourself in the place of Bella completely, you know, and that's, it makes me kind of a little wobbly then to, because if this was a game, you know, with a game, you can, you can tell the story more from like a, a first person view. So right. you literally are the one experiencing all this stuff. And so you are the one being the insert and, yeah, and that's a good point experiencing things when you pull it up, when you pull back though so um i think it's a little problematic because you switch over from uh, ha- uh you know really truly being able to insert yourself to ha- uh, you know you are you are playing the storyline a little bit more straight you know right uh when you create a character who is who is the innocent who is yes. experiencing this it's being I mean, done to like, someone instead of Yes, you being exactly. Placed in that scenario, yeah. Yeah, and I think with books, it, it's also similar. Like when I read the first book long ago of Twilight, uh, I thought it was boring and lame and kind of stupid, and definitely a fantasy uh, for people who were into that kind of possessive relationship play. Um, but um, you know. You are literally like in Bella's head. You're there. You're. It's all first person uh, narrative, you know, and almost all of the writing is about how awesome Edward is, you know. So you right. barely learn a thing about her. So you can be in that when you make a movie of it. Now you get to see Chris Stewart be that blank slate, you know, right. and, and have... it becomes even more comical in the movie because <laughs> yeah, every like. Every single person in the school is just filleting her nonstop, like about how <laughs> like she hasn't done anything. She like barely hangs out with them, and they're all like, "Oh my god, she's so amazing! Oh my god, Bella, you're so amazing!" It's just like two hours of just like <laughs> just God, like word fellatio. That's what's going on. It's it, it, that was one the of best, the, the for the most part, part. I found the movie just dull. I didn't. Oh yeah. Like they're individual scenes that I found bad, but for the most part, I just found it boring you know, I, rather than bad. I actually like the first like, half hour of the movie, and then the vent... It does a decent job with the setting, actually. Yeah. I will give it that. Yeah. yeah, and then... Yeah, I agree. And then the vampires came, and suddenly it was like, what's going on now? Um, actually... That slow-mo scene? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I would just like to point out that the director of Twilight was uh, Catherine Hardwick, she directed 13, and you can kind of see hints of that in the movie. Yeah. I mean, I think. And the screenwriter was Melissa Rosenberg, at the time notable for oh. Dexter, although a little more famous now for her Netflix series, Jessica Jones. Of course. Really? Uh, Which is uh, an interesting thing to think about because <laughs> uh, that series approaches the idea of a kind of pos- possessive, obsessed male figure in a much more negative mm. manner. Yeah, and I don't know if she ever intentionally crossed her mind that there's a twilight element or not. I, she's said nothing about it. I've seen in interviews, but who knows? Well, that would be really interesting because mm. uh, you know I, I don't know if all of you have seen Jessica Jones, so I I don't want to give out spoilers. Yeah, n- no spoilers about Jessica Jones in this thing because our audience may not have seen it. Okay, uh, then. Uh, Let's just say the idea of somebody watching you all the time, you know, in in the Twilight series, it's seen as romantic. 
you know, like, like this beautiful thing, like he just can't let her go in Jessica Jones. It's, it's basically like through the same behavior through a filter of reality where it's like, no, this is horrifying. Yeah. Horrifying. You wouldn't want to wake up to see this boy you met at school and have talked to like three times watching you sleep, you know, that's, that's terrifying. Uh, in the yeah. book, they didn't do they didn't do this in the movie that I remember, but in the book, he literally fucks up her truck so she can't drive to a friend's house, um, a male friend's house, uh, because they had a small fight, and that was seen again as like, oh, he just. He just needed to talk to her, you know? Yeah. Uh, that's how it's played. But if that happens in reality, if somebody, like, cu- cuts your brakes or something right. so that you can't, <laughs> you know, that's, that is a terrifying situation to be in. And, um, you know, that's, that's kind of the, the thing I have with these is, like, I, I walk a line because on one half of the line, I totally understand the appeal of playing that part uh, to fulfill like a sexual like gratification, uh, uh, you know, where you consent to it and, and it's, it, it, you know, it's a game. But right. when it's played straight, like in Diabolic Lo- Lovers or in Twilight, it feels, uh, it feels wrong. You know, it feels like it's actually saying this isn't just a game. This is the way this is, this is what true love is man true love is your dude being completely like so so into you that he goes crazy and he'll like he'll like fuck up your shit if you leave them and you know what i mean right yeah i I think it's about i'm almost down on i I guess one one question i have is to what extent does the fandom actually you know inculcate that because i remember an interview conducted at the height of twilight mania in around 2008 or so where the, and they included a brief snippet from a 19 year old college student and she was saying how romantic it was that edward you know watched bella while she slept you know and uh the interviewer asked how do you feel um like if your boyfriend did that and she said you'd be completely creeped out yeah and it's very romantic when the fictional perfect vampire boyfriend does it but a real person with their neuroses and foibles and their reality unacceptable unacceptable to her yeah i guess my question is how much does the audience perceive it as a fantasy and how much you know does it does it be delineated between fantasy and the other thing because you know we we tolerate and engage in all kinds of disreputable you know fantasies without explicitly saying that That is totally true, but I think that it also is – okay. So uh, you run into the argument that it's fantasy, it's fantasy, uh, it's uh, where we're just basically uh, being able to enact our fantasies on the screen because we can't do it in real life because if you do it in real life, it's it's messed up, you know. Hmm. Uh, That's why, you know – so, for instance, something like, I don't know, like the Disney movies wherein the girl falls in love and three days later they're married and they live happily ever after. Total fantasy that would never happen. Well, not maybe maybe not never, never, but definitely it is a <laughs> low percentage of success if you meet your guy and three days later you, you wed and rule a kingdom together, you know. Uh, uh, I I mean, on one hand... Uh, and there's a lot of people who grow up with the kinds of fantasies, the the macho fantasies of boys cartoons that were on, on when I was a kid. You know, uh, I don't meet a whole bunch of guys who are really like, uh, you know, rough about like what what is a boy's role compared to a girl's role. And I and I live in an area of the United States that's very that's very conservative. And I don't see a lot of that, you know, Um but at the same time, I think that uh, the bigger problem is if that viewpoint is never acknowledged as, um, you know, it's this idea of pop culture uh, reflecting reality rather than causing reality, you know. 
so if if there's a woman out there who writes this fantasy of a of a guy who is enthralled by his girl to the point where he like uh can't even be around her because she smells so good you know yeah. uh, and he wants to literally eat her um i i don't know it makes me wonder what element of our society still is finding this idea of female agency to be not completely all there yet you know the uh, mm. that women still have to kind of cater to this idea of uh this is what a true relationship is this is what it is to be in love this is what it is to be a woman you know um because this stuff i mean it if it were like i think diabolic lovers is pretty niche you know but twilight was fucking huge and that is what makes me worry less yeah. than this idea of a fantasy on screen that's that's cool you know have your fantasy on screen but what out there is still needing to be addressed in our society where uh, in, uh, where women are feeling like oh yeah i just i want someone completely enthralled but you know what i mean like that's that's what i i have to be i have to be perfect this guy needs to be you know it's okay for a guy to be completely possessive you know i don't know and there's still plenty of domestic violence situations in around the world where women are slowly but surely lured in with this you know back and forth of beautiful sweet behavior that grows more and more possessive until it's it's detrimental to the woman you know and i don't know it it it, it just feels like something is there to allow allow something like twilight to become a giant hit even though the romance character is um is terrifying <laughs> yeah i mean i think it's well two things i guess i mean i think it's interesting in terms of i think i feel like in pop culture broadly there's sort of two extremely divergent ways that people are are sort of understanding the stuff and they're sort of on extreme opposites. Like on one hand, you have sort of like, oh, you should never criticize like stuff like Twilight or whatever. Like you're shaming their fantasies or whatever. Everything's fine. Like whatever you want to fantasize about, go nuts. Like blah blah. blah. Um, where just like, you know, it's it's this embrace of maybe arguably bad art, uh, as long as it sort of like fulfills some sort of like sexual fantasy element where it's like, well, you shouldn't be, you know, shaming people for whatever they want to, uh, you know, jack it to or the opposite. Um, and then there's this other sort of approach to this sort of art, which is like extremely sort of um, moralistic where it's sort of like any sort of problematic element in a piece of artwork is like inherently endorsing that on some level. And he's, it's weird to see those two butting heads, I think, and it's not going to stop anytime soon. Um, but it is sort of this weird extreme position on both sides. And then the other part of it is I almost give more leeway to something like Diabolic Lovers because it's so over the top. It's so much a work of fantasy. Whereas, like, I think what maybe... I think the ambiguity in Twilight is what makes a lot of people uncomfortable, where it's like, I, like, in Diabolic Lovers, like I said, it's so over the top, and maybe, even though, on some level, probably is a reflection of, you know, Japanese society, but with Twilight, it gets a lot more muddy in terms of, like, what is Stephanie Meyer endorsing, or, what you know, does she believe this stuff? And by most appearances, it kind of, she does kind of think it's romantic. Um, and so that gets, like, where... You know, where is the line between, and this doesn't have to deal even with sex, it can deal with something like violence, like, what is a gr- what what separates a really great, like, piece of trash art versus something that's sort of, like, morally repugnant? Like, because it's a weird, like, you think about, um, I don't know, like, uh, kind of, like, exploitation movies or something, it's like, what, a good example would be, like, uh, let's see, like Sanin is a is a Russian novel 
And that's sort of money, because it sort of engages in the reverse of this. It's like the super protagonist is super Randian sort of uh, mentality, and it's basically more or less a serial rapist. Um, but, so it's like, where where does the line between acceptable trash and something that's actually advocating for something hmm. really awful lie? And it gets messy. Okay. Yeah, you're uh, totally right. Like- I feel like um, a related point you said there when you're delineating the two groups, the kind of moralistic objection and the other one, is that there's also the line between critiquing the subject and critiquing the fandom, which I guess was was somewhere where I I parted ways. Like obviously at the height of Twilight, I enjoyed reading people mocking Twilight and watching videos mocking Twilight as much as the next person. Uh, There were a lot of people who did. But I feel like when they're t- attacking people personally, you know, the, the teenage girls who go to see a movie or the, the mothers who go to see a movie, look at this, 40, 40 year old women who want to see Tyler Lautner take off his shirt. Isn't that hilarious? It, it, it had a kind of more mean spirited end to it, I think, a lot of the time. So, you know, even if Twi- Twilight has a lot of problematic issues, which it arguably does, obviously does, and mm-hmm. it does reflect to a certain extent the values of Stephanie Meyer, who I don't know a lot about, but I know that she's a Mormon. And my understanding was she was socially conservative. I don't know if that's true. But all, all these things are still distinct from how a fandom interacts with something. Lord of the Rings being another good example, because the values of Lord of the Rings fans are not the same as those of a mid-20th century um, British Catholic. You know. Okay, so... um. About the whole fantasy thing, I actually mm-hmm. um, made a note to myself, an observation that Twilight is a fantasy of perfect caring, whereas Diabolic Lovers was a fantasy of perfect submission. But with what you're saying, it doesn't see just um, has made me reconsider this, that it's not so much, there's not such a big difference between the two, that what looks like caring, it looks really creepy when you just step outside of it a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. I think I feel like the the difference is um Twilight's creepiness feels unintentional and Yeah, it feels buried in a creepiness yeah. feels like the selling point. <laughs> yeah. You know? yeah. One of them is knowingly trashy. And I don't yeah. know with the other one if Stephanie Meyer thought she was yeah. writing trash. That's where it gets weird. <laughs> I guess winking at the audience helps a lot. <laughs> you know. Uh, I mean, I guess the thing, I mean, as far as what you're saying, it is, it's like, on some level, I assume Time Hawk Lovers is winking at the audience, but I don't actually know. I, like, I don't... This doesn't an yeah. audience which wants to be winked at. I think, like, the most honest expression towards the straight. audience is... You know, the bit at the end where they're literally talking to the audience. Yeah, that's true. I mean, the, 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 yeah. the Diabolic Lovers is geared specifically towards people who have a favorite one of these characters and want to have a idealized fantasy of relationship with them right. to an even greater extent than the Twilight films are, I think. And obviously the Twilight films are really built on the idea of, you know, Edward or... God, what was the name of the other one? Jacob? Yeah. Jacob, wasn't it? Jacob, there? yeah. I don't like Ebony, any scene in that movie that didn't involve the main characters was like a thousand times better. <laughs> like, anytime, especially like any of the adult characters were doing anything, like, it actually engaged me briefly. Well, that reminded me, they also had kind of uh, disappearing parents in that as well, didn't they? And yeah. You know, the... I think it was Bella's mother barely <laughs> appears in the movie at all. And her father kind yeah. of fades into the background. Yeah, the mother, like, is literally put on a in a car and sent away well it's also kind of interesting that both twilight and um diabolic lovers both their vampires are all super rich that um i mean that's basically how vampires work in fiction well the classic vampires they're like um the walking embodiment of uh privilege and aristocracy yeah. 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 Well, I mean, that's just built not in. Even, <laughs> built into another the parallel. Genre. They're all, they're all ancient, and they're still going to school. 
which I found interesting I, as well. <laughs> I feel like when it comes down to it, when we talk about the modern vampire tradition, we're talking about something that goes back to Dr. Polidori writing a book about the man who he served as doctor, Lord Byron, hmm. who was very rich, very privileged, and he also did a whole lot of something else. <laughs> I mean, it's I, really I, baked into the romance angle, too. I mean, if you watch any... I mean, yeah, that, that's what I mean. I mean, he, yeah. Byron, a lot of men, a lot of women all over Europe. You know. He got around. I mean, you can look at just Fifty Shades of Grey, you know, rich CEO, if you read almost any shoujo romance inevitably the guy they end up uh falling in love with it's like oh by the way i have an enormous house <laughs> and probably have some refined uh artistic capabilities or something so yeah that's definitely baked deep into the romance angle that the person the the sexy dude will inevitably end up being extremely loaded and also probably talented in some way, just to put a little icing on the cake. So, I don't check off okay. all the boxes, not just one or two. I do find it interesting that uh, the extremely... Okay, so I feel like the does the fantasy man have money or not pendulum swings back and forth. That's true. Uh, because there have been eras wherein your uh, Rothschild, you know giant house, broody man, uh, you know, uh, sexy voice, uh, woman in the attic, you know, <laughs> like, uh, that, that was a thing, but then you, you turn, and then there was the bohemian artist who had nothing and you would live in, you know, delicious squalor together, you know or, what I mean? Or like Jack and it, Titanic or something, yeah. Yeah, exactly, Jack and Titanic, uh, right. Although I do find it really intriguing that you never get a vampire. I I have yet to see a vampire story where the vampire had nothing. You know, even in Angel, uh, he, he might have lived in basements and stuff, but they were always really chic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, like... that's, that's TV, though. I mean, TV, especially network TV, doesn't do poverty well. Poverty always looks very nice. Yeah. True. <laughs> I mean, okay. look, look, look at the friends, you know, they're, they're in their 20s, they're living in New York, and they live, you know, in that big apartment, or however many apartments. <laughs> that I, is actually I a good point. You're, well. you're right. Maybe, maybe Angel, maybe that basement uh, bungalow of his was supposed to be, you know, him living on the edge. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. By, by Hollywood standards, he was deeply impoverished. As far as the uh, characterization of the vampires, that's actually I was surprised at how like awkward Edward was in the first half of the movie. Yes, like that actually... it, I was really surprised because I expected more, and the brooding stuff comes later. But in the first half of the movie, he's really kind of a dork, actually. Like I think she actually compares him to Spider Man at one point, doesn't she? Yes. Yeah, so uh, he's kind of like a, a Peter Parker yeah. sucker, you know. Yeah, in the in the book he's he's much more portrayed as a cool guy, but okay, so it seems to be this idea of this cool guy who is also kind of introverted and right, yeah. And he likes news, you know, that's how they connect. They like in his room or whatever, uh they listen to the same music. Right, he's got a touch uh, of hipster and just yeah, not and, too much, just enough. Exactly. And they also it, it, you know, he, he hangs out with his family and they play baseball. Like, I mean, he's like the all-American vampire right. boy. <laughs> so I was thinking that first scene. No, not the first scene. But, uh, you know, after he does his, like, throwing up gig and they, they like, have class for the first time and he actually stays. <laughs> like, he's just so, he's so bumbling. It's, it was surprising to me. I was like, well, maybe they're trying to humanize him just a little bit. I love it. The best part about that scene in the chemistry lab, I think it was, yeah. is him holding his nose like like she smells horrific or something, or he's about to like yeah. throw up. That well, that was a... that was pretty well done, I thought. Yeah. <laughs> there was also, I mean, it's it, it's fun when you have something like obviously with dialogue lovers, which is animated, you can fully commit to how fucking outrageous absolutely everything is. But it was funny to me 
there's like this push and pull with Twilight where like one half of it is, is trying to do this pretty decent job of establishing the setting, but then any time certain characters came on the screen, it became hilarious. So like there's there's like a one second shot, like extremely brief shot, but it was maybe my biggest laugh in the movie where it's just all the vampires sitting at like one of the tables in the uh in the dining hall and it just looks so fucking outrageous because everyone else in the school is dressed normally and then they are you know super pasty with their red eyes and they're like weird like cw fantasy clothes and there's just something hit so funny about how ridiculous they looked being placed into a mundane setting like it just does not work visually at all and that and kept happening throughout the movie it reminded me it reminds me of seeing someone in real life who's trying to dress like they're from the Matrix or something. It's like that looks really cool when you're flipping through the air and the lighting is correct and you're in a movie. But, you know, when you're like walking into TJ Maxx dressed like Neo, like <laughs> all the coolness disappears. <laughs> and that's that's how big parts of this movie to me felt. Because anytime any of the vampires appeared into this like more or less realistic setting, and they just looked outrageous. Or, or you know, uh, the the scene, the, my other biggest laugh in the movie, was where Edward is sparkling, which obviously is dumb unto itself, but the fact that he goes, this is what I am, wow, he's fine. <laughs> like, the dichotomy between what's being said and the visuals on screen is it's too much. It's too much. Uh, the director for the movie version, they did actually a pretty decent job uh, for what they were given uh, to work with because the book, I'm I am I am not kidding when I say that there are th- that that scene in the forest where he he shows her hi, him sparkling he shows his sparkling skin to her by taking off his shirt. It is literally three pages of of description. Jesus. Uh, of yeah of feelings of like no real dialogue just like her being a gog at edward's beauty so i feel like they did pretty good about making it so unbelievable you know what i mean like oh my god look at this sparkling man you know yeah. what i mean <laughs> i mean the thing is if, if he had well, just well, been I mean, sparkling i mean it would have been dumb but like, i could have Good. How little he's wearing, you know. I mean, it goes all the way down to like his navel. You know, impressed by how much they pushed that <laughs> in that movie. Uh, I mean, if, if his pants were any lower, it would have to be like an eighteen film or something. I don't think I would have laughed if it wasn't for the line of dialogue, though. That's what made it funny. But this is what I am. It's like it, it, it's like you're saying you have leprosy while you're smart. Like <laughs> it's like really oh, you're you're trying yeah. to pass this off as a tortured thing. Like, but, but you know that that's what a lot of this stuff is. I mean, no, I these know. fantasies of people cursed with being awesome. Yeah, no, it's true. It's, just, it's the epitome of that. <laughs> yes. And actually, the thing about vampires is that, you know, vampires are undead. In, in some sense, at least traditionally, they're rotting corpses, or they're at least moving corpses. Right. And this is, like, most visceral in, say, a film like Nosferatu, where you sometimes actually just see him lying there in the coffin completely motionless. And his body is weird and patchy and falling off and everything. And he's rats everywhere. But here, it's more like vampires are aliens, frankly. Or yes. just fairies. Completely yes. sparkling. They're, they're the magical beings who are, have an unfortunate desire for human blood and who are so perfect. You know, oh, wow. there, there's never any sense that like she doesn't like smell him like a corpse or anything. There's, there's nothing deathly about him other than his pallor which is really just because he's just that white you know <laughs> he's super white you know? <laughs> well diabolic lovers they kind of play with that too they're they're just perfect teenage boys they were born they they didn't mm. uh die they the they have a father they have mothers whom they were born from uh and when they reached, it looks like when they reached around the age of 17 or so, they just stopped aging. And, um, uh, yeah, I find that interesting. Like, to be a hot, sexy vampire, you 
you have to have more blessed with awesome than you can have curse, you know? Yeah. Uh, because if you have too much curse, then you start getting into uh, monster territory. Like, uh, Dracula, I think, was fairly blessed with and, awesome, uh, except, um, you know, what he did to people was was the, the monstrous thing, you know? Uh, he, he was... The, <laughs> At least in, um, in Bram Stoker's Dracula, they do keep emphasizing the idea that he's a corpse. You know, that, that he's uh, dead, yeah. but not dead. In fact, the term undead was essentially coined by that novel. So it's kind of an idea it's obsessed with, his lifelessness, in a way. Which, you know, other vampire stories either play up or, as here, ignore entirely. Yeah. Actually, you know what? In Twilight, are they actually dead or what? You know, that's a good question. I don't know. Are they? Although, wasn't he about to die? In Twilight... And then they made him into a vampire? Okay, no. In, in, yeah, what, what? okay, so Twilight's vampirism, uh, if I recall correctly, is basically, um, it's not death. They aren't dead. Uh, it's a poison. They're, they're, they're basically made of poison. Their blood is poison. Their skin is po- Their skin... Actually, their skin isn't poison. What their skin is, is it's crystallized. So the reason why they're cold is because their skin is literally malleable uh like a silicate or something at this point um and uh their saliva is poison so when they bite you uh you will die or you will turn into a vampire uh the poison will uh start changing you um uh in fact one reason why some of the fandom was upset with the fact that Bella and um, Edward had a baby is because all the fluids in the body were supposed to be poisoned. So how could he ejaculate like living sperm? Um, and I guess Stephanie Meyer just kind of hand waved that uh, somehow. I don't know. These are the <laughs> I, I like, I like that they were concerned, you know, pe- people were making fun of twilight fans earlier, but that's, that is an enormously interesting <laughs> concern to have. Yes. Well, I mean that sincerely. Actually, I mean, to that's be the kind of argument honest, you're having. That's the kind of argument I want to be in. You know? But continue. Yeah, uh, I think that, that at that point too, like, um, I think actually to be perfectly honest, my big problem with the Twilight uh, series is she created a really interesting take on vampires. Another interesting take on vampires, which is the opposite of almost every other vampire story I've ever seen, is uh, the vampires are strongest when they're young. Uh, as they age, they grow less powerful physically. However, uh, they almost all develop side powers. Like, for instance, Edwards is uh, telepathy. Um, and if you ever go beyond the first story, there's a little girl vampire who has, like, kind of a kinetic energy. So basically, like, mutants. Um, yeah, like superheroes. Almost. That goes... Yeah, exactly. So that grows stronger and stronger and stronger um, while they go grow physically weaker. And also, also, uh, the only thing that can kill a vampire is another vampire because their skin is so strong. Yeah, uh, I mean, you literally have to rip them to shreds. At a so it's like point, this like... really interesting concept that she uses to kind of write this moopy love story. <laughs> yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, a lot of the stuff is like... Most of the ideas seem so stupid because they're executed in a stupid way, but they're not inherently stupid. So yes. vampires are inherently, yeah. obviously, you know, not real. It's complete fantasy to begin with. So you can do whatever you really want with it if you do it well. Oh, absolutely. And at the end of the day, that's what makes these movies not work. It's because they're boring. They're dull. Right. It's not, <laughs> you know... The, there, there are like decent elements buried somewhere in here, but yeah, like you said, it's t- it's used to tell just this boring, dull story full of boring, dull characters. And I mean, even some like everyone makes fun of uh, what's called vampire baseball, and it, in the movie, just uh, you know, budget, it looks really bad. But I don't actually hate the idea. Like, if you had superpowers, what would it be like to play? It's like it's not an inherently you could actually make something fun with that. It's not an inherently stupid idea. But not it's just it, executed badly. Not only is it not an inherently stupid idea, it's 
probably a good idea for emblematic for the take that the film and presumably the book has on the Coens. Like one of the consequences of vampires being rich is that they're also usually old money. By old money, we mean aristocracy. And by aristocracy, we almost always mean European aristocracy. You know, Dracula mm-hmm. is from Carpathia and he has ties allegedly to Wallachia, you know, and, uh, you know, Camilla, everything else. So, so they're usually rich people with a European aristocratic background. And while Diabolic Lovers doesn't actually say anything specific about Europe, there's definitely something very pseudo-European about yeah, I mean, its vampires. It uses yeah. European their, their, their mansion is kind of European. Their kind of dress is European. I'm sure, like, eventually at some point they might say that they have some Pacific European connection. Or if they did say it and I, I missed it, well, the series was terrible, and I don't apologize for missing that. But with Twilight, the Cullens, they're rich, but they're all American rich. And they've been in America a long time. And they've, they've adapted American ways, and American <laughs> lifestyle, and American sports. So it, it's a very specific way to approach a vampire. Vampires as natives. Right. Well, not natives. The actual natives are the werewolves, which is a whole other discussion. But um, in both cases, they're very American ideas. And those are the ideas that she's foregrounding, a kind of very American take on vampires and an American take on werewolves, kind of an American uh, romantic mythology, if you will. Well, see, there's nothing wrong with that. As far as American vampires go, I've always thought that Lost Boys was the canonical one, that the rock star vampires are the American version of them. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. I guess it's all really... uh... I I guess my, my one quibble is you know so many iconic rock stars are inconveniently british but yeah that, that's a good point although on the question of um whether the backstory of diabolic lovers is going to be there's if there's going to be more revealed um i do have to mention that there's a second season that's showing right now which yeah i think it's a completely different characters oh, though well i think it's the same same basic girl, new cast of douchey dudes, ready to roll, from what I understand. Either way, I'm sure if I went online and looked at the fandoms, they have theories. Yeah, well, I, guess, I think in some of the flashback scenes, they showed, like, European villages or something. So, yeah. Uh, I think you're right, yeah. You know, one thing I must say that's great about fandoms is how you can come together with your brethren and fill in the cracks together, you know? <laughs> Amen yeah. to that. Probably, uh, probably won't be joining this one uh, either of these, but you know, somewhere out there. Yeah, I'm pretty sure I'm never gonna watch the second season of The Bollock Lovers. No, it was, it was like I said after the the first three episodes, I just had a, a enormously entertaining time, and then I just wanted it to stop after that as soon as possible. <laughs> it's like. <laughs> I, uh, like, I honestly cannot I, count how many times I stopped an episode just to see how many minutes are left. It's like I kept pausing each episode. It's like, oh my god, there's still 13 minutes left. Right. Yeah, and, and, the and there's like 15 short, minutes. It feels so things. long. Yeah. Because it is. It's just the same. Once you've seen a few scenes, you've seen the entire thing because it's the same thing over and over yeah. and over and over and over again. I think and, that's really god, what they're eating her again. About. This one's the pink one. Yeah, and it's, it's not really like one. the scenes aren't really done in like an interesting enough way where it's like actually it's not uh maybe if you're like fifteen or whatever, but it's not really gonna turn anybody on. It's pretty dull. It's like the 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 treatment is something else, but in terms of actual like Twilight, the actual romantic con- uh, content is very tame. Um and sort of dull. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. I guess that's kind of, you know, even with all the sex, like the relationship ickiness of both, uh, my main complaint is that they're just kind of boring, both of them. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's what it really comes down to. It's it's just they're dull. I was bored by both. Yeah, I mean, to be blunt, I watch stuff that's a lot more offensive than either one of them, you know, just in terms of content, like deliberately disturbing and provocative and the rest of it but it it usually goes somewhere there's usually a bit of a narrative engine to it so 
like while I'm not endorsing these hypothetical things they're talking about, I definitely wasn't as bored by them. You know, I'm thinking particularly for a lot of like really bad anime, which I've seen on purpose, um, like really terrible, bizarre stories, uh, guys with grenades on their um, pubic hair kind of things. Stuff happens. I mean, it's, it's I definitely wouldn't be happens. bored by that. So, yeah. yeah. That's Mad what? Bull for all our listeners who want to look that up, who are really intrigued by what I just said. <laughs> <laughs> well you're totally right about like there have been more offensive things that i have read i mean oh god if you read like lolita for instance like throughout that book i felt sick you know beautifully written and i would read it again <laughs> you know it's it's like this beautiful piece of literature about a pedophile but uh yeah that it, it was because it was written well. I, you know, you can you can get you can sink your teeth into the story, into the character, and it's just like Twilight. There are plenty of people who interpreted Lolita straight. You know, they saw. I mean, there's a reason why Lolita is in our culture, our, our, our as a as a term. You know, this idea of the temptress, the nymphette. You know, but uh, it was still something that I could read many times over more than I could read Twilight ever again or watch Diabolic God. <laughs> 15 minutes of Diabolic Lovers again. <laughs> well, as far as plot goes, like um, with Diabolic Lovers, it's it's pretty much impossible to spoil the story because there's nothing to spoil. Like, uh, it's almost all entirely surface. Like just yeah, it it seems to set up a mystery at the start, and then it just sputters out, and you get some very vague character background. But that's really it. Actually, it kind of reminds me of um, another anime, uh, Rosen Maiden oh, God. from Clamp. That um, the way it um, focuses on the atmosphere over the plot, and I do have to admit, I only could watch one episode of Rosen Maiden, and after that, I was like. I I can't take this nothing I, more. If we if we weren't doing this podcast, I would have never continued with uh, Diabolic I, Lovers. I watched like two seasons of Rose and Maiden and the OVAs. Oh. I I cannot honestly tell you why, but I did. Actually, you know what? I can tell you why. It's because I liked the intro sequence. I'm I am a good sucker for a good intro, and it's a very peppy alley project number. There. But the the show is just nothing. You know, it's this guy, and he has some dolls. And the dolls are different personalities. I feel like the true thing is that you are willing to punish yourself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that's probably be, true. Uh, but yeah. I, I think actually that this is leading to another thing. I'm talking about my admitted shallowness. I like good production values. I think one of the other issues for both Twilight and Diabolic Lovers is, as we've referred to for a bit for Twilight, is the absence of them. Diabolic Lovers is at best competent as a series. This is not a particularly artistic series by the standards of uh, the present day when it was made. It has no particularly stunning animations. Designs are fine. Everything fits a certain type. You know, the Gothic Castle, it's fine. I've seen better Gothic Castles in anime, but this one just about does the business. So I... Possibly for budget reasons, because neither of these things, even Twilight, which is hugely successful as a book series, had a big budget. Mm -hmm. Because they're seeing like they're pandering to a very specific audience, an audience which may not necessarily justify going the extra level with these projects. Which I think is also kind of a defeating loop as to the quality. If you're going to produce something that isn't as good as it could be, then it could just wind up as boring. Like there's prob you probably could make a version of Diabolic Lovers which is awful, has terrible values, and is not boring. Yeah, absolutely. And the anime is not bad. Yeah. And I think the same is true for Twilight. Well, yeah, I mean, that's, yeah, I mean, agreed. like, it's, you know, going back to all the Russian literature I've read, there's plenty of books that I've read, just, God, not even, not even something like Lolita, where there's just nuances to these, to these stories. There's, uh, what was the one I mentioned earlier? Sonnen. I mean, the the values of that book are just repugnant, but it's it is well read. It's it's competently done. Even the 
really awful like sexual content like it's well written i can see people actually being turned on by that like he, the, the band understood how hot fantasy stuff works even if he was probably a fucking psycho um but yeah this is it's just it's just boring there's just nothing i just I'm not engaged. Not, I couldn't even really be angry at either of these series because I was just so <laughs> bored. And I actually got more... The more deep into vampire stuff the Twilight movie got, the more bored I became. Like, it, cause it's, cause, and that's really when the budget problems start to pop up, I think. Because you can make an acceptable like, high school drama not that much money, but then at the end of the movie, they feel obligated to like be like well this is our action scene and it looks like it was made on two dollars and everyone looks like they were dressed from the like cw rejects pile and it's just it, there's no you know if you like surprise if you put no effort into making an action scene an action scene it ends up being really dull and that's basically how it happens like well, uh, I don't know if uh, okay. So uh, that scene is pretty notorious in the books. Um, for uh, are we talking the one where she's dying or whatever? <laughs> Just that uh, whole fight scene. In the, in yeah. The okay. So in in the book, she literally passes out. You see nothing. You hear about it after she comes to. <laughs> yeah, that seems to be a recurring theme. I remember I haven't watched it, but I've I've talked her. You know, red people who have seen the the third Twilight movie, uh, and it's funny because they you know they did the thing where like all the other trilogies are doing where they split it up where they really did not need to because there just isn't enough content there. But so in the last movie, like the big evil vampires and the uh, spoilers, I don't even care, um, and the good vampires or whatever uh, come and, and meet, and they're like, "Ooh, there's going to be a big battle." But the way it ends, in in the books, is like. They just walk away. Like, the fight, no fight happens. They just talk for a minute, and then they're like, uh, let's not do this. Okay. So, in the movie, they're like, we need to have something. We cannot have this movie have the big climactic battle be, be, they talk to each other and then walk away. Like, it's not. So, they, they set up for the battle, and they have this giant fight scene with, like, you know, werewolves, like, ripping off people's arms and shit. And then at the very end of the battle, they're like, oh, well, that's what would have happened if we did fight. And that would be bad, so let's not do that. <laughs> what? <laughs> That's fantastic. Right? Uh, it's like I. But, but I how does that work? Their, their ingenuity. I'd be like, no, no. no I, I have to. Game. I have to know how that worked. Like, yeah. well, they didn't just completely break the fourth wall, did they? Was it like Edward used his telepathy to show them a hypothetical situation? I, uh, I mean, how would they all know no, no. that that's what okay, would happen? So- one of the girls, this is this is in the first, uh, one of the girls is, um, uh, she's, uh, what do you call it, uh, uh, an oracle, basically. She can see the, into the future. So uh, is, I'm assuming that they used her <laughs> as I, Yeah, I don't know. I'd love to know. <laughs> and, and I think if, they, if they, they did, even, like, kill fantastic. off a few of the big characters in the scene just to, like, have some fun with it. <laughs> I don't know what I expected. Of course there's a character who can see the future. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I was hoping she it was tells, something bizarre. But in fact, on. in the first, in the first, I don't know if she said, I can't remember if she said this in the movie, but I remember the book that, that she said something about uh, being totally cool with Bella because she knew that someday she would be a vampire. Like, just not yet. Just not yet. Right. Uh, yeah. So... Well, as far as anticlimactic battles go, isn't that kind of how the Dracula book ended? That the chase and the final battle just took like in one page, and suddenly Dracula was dead. Yeah. Oh, I feel like I feel like that's actually a weird convention of older art that has died. Like it, it's weird watching old movies sometimes because can't remember what movie it was. It wasn't an action movie, but uh, it was, you know, on TCM or something a couple months ago. And, you know, it's this, like, romantic movie, and, you know, the the couple says their goodbyes and walks away, and then the fucking Zeppelin bombs the bridge or something, and she runs over, and he's like, oh, he's dead. And then the movie just ends. Like, that's it. Like, there's no... 
there's no sitting around and thinking about the implications or the emotional results. It's like, oh, he's dead. Story's over. Like, uh, I feel like that used to be fine. Uh, that somewhere along the way, people were like, this this appears a little comical now. Take literally any Hitchcock movie. They all end very abruptly. Yeah. The moment the plot in a Hitchcock movie stops, the movie stops. He's not interested in any post-plot denouement. But as I recall, the end with Dracula is, the funny thing is, is that there's what happens in the novel and there's what everyone thinks happens because it's happened in virtually every film version. What happens in the novel is they catch up with him when he's sleeping in the day and, you know, they just completely trash his coffin. It's ripped to pieces. So there's never a whole thing where, you know, they go down and they stab him in his coffin. Like at that point, he's actually being, you know, uh, in a carriage or something being brought back to Carpathia in continental Europe. So he's not even in his castle or anything. It's something like that. Honestly, I haven't read the book in like seven years, but that's how I remember it. And that's how we're going to have it on the record. Actually, you're right. I'm like misremembering stuff. Just like Dracula. The story has been done so many times, it's just all bleeding mm. together for me. That's true. I mean, we keep talking about Dracula, but we never or rarely clarify which Dracula we're talking about. Because there are many Draculas that are quite important. Like when we talk about American vampires, we have to acknowledge that one of the first is Bela Lugosi's Dracula. And of course, he typifies the idea of American vampires still being aristocratic Europeans. He's part of that entire tradition. While in Europe, obviously, we have Christopher Lee as the premier, you know, hammer Dracula. And uh, the weird Nosferatu tradition in Germany, and blah, 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 blah. Dracula has cast a very long shadow, indeed. Anyways, um, I think it's about to wrap this up. Yeah. yeah. Does, anyone, does anyone have any final thoughts? My final thought um, is that let us never, let's never do hate watching, because let's never deliberately watch something <laughs> we know is bad. Because if we're watching this, like, I, I don't think we can get through it. I think we learned final... a lot and wouldn't recommend either of these two works. Uh, My final same? thought is we <laughs> absolutely should do hate watching because I think it produces some very interesting material for the uh, podcast. I think this is, might be the best episode we've had because we've been able to hash out a lot of complicated ideas around these two uh, these two products. You know, I mean, <laughs> while, while I enjoyed the first two, to a certain extent, there's an element of these things are also great. What ways are they great? You know. I think it's good to be able to vary it up a bit. Indeed. I think I, I feel like, okay, uh, I am totally down with hate watching as well because as much as uh, getting to the end of Diabolic Lovers and as much as I really didn't want to see Twilight again, it did remind me of why I had been avoiding both like properties. Uh, or not that, not Diabolic, but why I had avoided the Twilight series at least. And also... It is a little bit fun just to bitch, you know, to have a bit of a bitch fest <laughs> about, uh, but not all the time. I think that it would be good to intersperse with, you know, truly enjoyable anime slash other works. <laughs> For sure. For sure. Well, that's true. Well, and oh, on that note. And, wait, wait, wait. Sorry. And also totally would not recommend watching either. Uh unless you are a, a teenage girl who has a fetish for really asshole Even then, men. at least find some <laughs> well-written. There's, you know, there's some well-written uh, asshole fiction out there. Go find that. Go find that. that. We need to make, like, just a wiki. <laughs> if this is what you see on the shelf, then actually read this. Yes, <laughs> you know, at least, you know, so, so assholes I guess one... with literary merit. They're out there. So I guess one final question, since we're kind of divided on the hate watch issue, the next anime we were to discuss was uh, Golgo 13, paired with Octopussy. And, you know, I've seen it. It's not good. And I picked it as kind of a masculine equivalent of Diabolic Lovers, a kind of ridiculous masculine fantasy. Do you want to still go ahead with that next time, or do you want to have something actually good? No, let's still go with it, because, like, it's just one movie instead of one TV show. I can get through a movie... Like, but the TV show. Okay. So next month, or whenever we release our next podcast, we will continue the theme of trashy gender-specific fiction. We've already looked at an example targeted towards women. We'll now be looking at an example targeted towards men. The James Bond. 
mythology, the idea of these uh, men who are very masculine and very violent. We have two examples. One is Golgo 13, the professional, a kind of anime James Bond type character. And we'll be comparing it with Octopussy. Both this film about Golgo 13 and the James Bond film Octopussy came out in the year 1983. So that should be somewhat interesting for you, our listeners. <laughs>